If you're with us on Wednesday night in St. Andrews Hall, you would notice there was an artist. There was an artist on the stage. His name is Mauricio Palacio, and he's going to be with us this entire week. He's an impressionist. He's worked on Emmy award-winning projects around the world. And with us this week, he's taking in what he's seeing and experiencing. And during the course of tonight's program, he's going to put that on a canvas for us. And all of his work will be placed around our campus as time goes on. So he's going to be with us. Uh, he was with us Wednesday. He'll be with us the rest of the week. The art that he did on Wednesday, it's in St. Andrew's Hall. If you have a moment before you leave, we'd love for you to go by and see what he's done. And you can watch this one uh, be created along the way. We're thankful that you're here with us tonight. I'm going to read one passage of scripture, and then afterwards you can stand and we'll sing some songs. Psalm 111 says, Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Please stand. Let's pray. Father, as we think about the work that you've given us to do, we're reminded that you are the great creator. You are the one who created us, and you are the one who is doing a great work. Not only have you called us to yourself, but you've called us to participate in that work. And Lord, if there's one in here tonight who does not know what it means to be in Christ, we would pray that you would touch them and give them the joy of knowing what's felt and experienced by many in this congregation. And Lord, if there's one who's wondering, where does work fit into my life as a Christian? Pray that this conference this weekend would clarify them and give them hope. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Shall last on my hymn at such a call. 
Please be seated. Mauricio, I'm not sure where you're going with that, but I'm liking it so far. I think you're right on track with, with what that's supposed to be. It looks great. Um, we just had three minutes with each missionary before the service began. Tonight, if you want to, we'd love for you to stay afterwards, walk through these doors, and hang out with them in the commons, get to know them a bit more, ask them any questions that you may have. If you are here with us as a missionary, if you would just stand up wherever you might be so the folks in here could see you. Are you all right here? Some over here? Okay. Let's thank them again for coming to be here with us. Tonight we'll be hearing from Andrew Scott. Just before he is going to talk, we're going to show a video that we have prepared. You'll get a larger picture of who he is and what he does. I went to your website today and read a little bit about him and there were this is my explanation of who I would say operation mobilization is and Andrew Scott three words come to mind as I watched uh, the materials the first is Jesus everything that he is about in his ministry is about it's Christ-centered the second thing I would say is that it's worldwide it's unbelievable the touch that this ministry has around the world and the third thing I would say is is an innovator that as they see needs, they find a way to meet them. That may involve the purchasing of very large ships that travel around the world that house many, many people that minister to people. And in a book that he's recently written, which we have copies of this called Scatter, which are for sale in the commons behind us, they, uh, he describes that as churches are be- uh, lessening around the world, there's a new way that we need to think of missions and involves our work. And his book that's called Scatter, Go There and Take Your Job With You is one of the more innovative ways that we're thinking of doing missions and we're describing this particular weekend. So thank you for being with us. If the usher would please come forward, we'll take tonight's offering. And Brian, if you'd put the slide up about the offering. You'll notice we have $20,000 for vocational missions teams. That's the work that we hope launches out of the missions conference as we think for ways that we can develop these teams. That's what the money will be for. Uh, $10,000 for diversity and campus ministry fund along with diversity within our denomination. And then two $2,500 slots for gospel and life training and Peter Law's work. So we pray that you'll give generously to these. Let me make sure I've not missed anything. I think that is it. Additionally, in the commons, we have our own Mike Murphy's CD. He and his team produced a CD this past year, so those for sale, and the back as well. And one of the main architects of thinking in an um, evangelical way about work is, of course, Tim Keller, and he wrote a book, Every Good Endeavor, and that's for sale as well. So please spend some time looking at those. Let's pray for this offering. Lord, thank you that you would allow us to be a part of your work here in Augusta. Thank you for the many who are with us. Thank you for the willingness of Andrew to be here tonight to share with us this innovative idea of taking our job and using it to build your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You are my joy, you are my song, you are the well, the one I'm drawing from, you are my Your love defends me. 
In the beginning, God created everything. He created a world full of people to know Him and to be known by Him. This is the story of the Bible, God bringing people to Himself. And when we read the Bible, we see how God went to great lengths to do this, and how much God cares about people knowing Him. You most likely already know this. And you probably live somewhere where people have a general understanding of this great love story between God and humanity. And if they don't know yet, there's probably somebody in town who can tell them. But did you also know that there are three billion people who will live and die without ever hearing this story? Not because they don't care, but because they don't have a choice. Nobody ever told them that once upon a time, God became a human just like them, so that he could teach them how to know their creator. 40% of the world doesn't know this, and they won't know this. Not unless something changes. Not unless someone goes to tell them. Jesus is our wonderful example. He left his natural home to come to us, and then he tells us to do the same thing. Because we love Jesus and care about the same things that he cares about, we care about this. That the whole world would know him. That every tongue, tribe, and people group would come and be able to worship him. So the question is, are we doing this? Going out into the world to bring the gospel to every tongue, tribe, and nation? Well, kind of. While churches do send people out, almost half the world still doesn't have any access to the gospel. But how is this possible? Aren't there people being sent? Well, yeah. There are about 400,000 people serving across the world today. But only 3% of them are actually going to the 40% who have never heard about Jesus. The other 97%? They're going to places that have already heard about Jesus. There's an imbalance. That imbalance leaves only one person for each 250,000 people who have never heard about Jesus. Put another way, we have a spirit-led calling to rethink our focus. When you look at how we use our resources, such as money, the picture doesn't look that much better. To be specific, Christians around the world are giving about 2% of their income to Christian causes. And less than 7% of that is going to cross-cultural workers. And of that cross-cultural giving, only 1 one-hundredth of that 0.1% is actually going to those working with the 3 billion people who don't know Jesus, have no church, or any Christian neighbors. The other 99% of all cross-cultural giving goes to the rest of the world that already has Christians, Bibles, and churches. Are you seeing the imbalance? Only 3% of our workers with only 1% of our cross-cultural finances are going to the 3 billion people who have never heard about Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves, are we okay with this? We want those 3 billion people to hear about the kingdom of God and how much God loves them. There are 17,000 ethno-linguistic groups in the world. People who share language, culture, and common history. 7,000 of them are considered unreached people. These are entire cultures who have never heard the amazing story of how Jesus loves them and came to save them. God has called us to pay attention to this, to love and care for the same things that he does. He put this desire on our heart, to see the unreached reached with the amazing story of the love of God. We want to see lasting local church planning movements begin among these people groups that brings renewal and transformation among these cultures and societies. Why? Because God has moved our hearts to see the gospel transform whole societies among the unreached. We know this task is bigger than us. Many of the areas that are in need of the gospel are difficult and resistant places. It isn't something that can be accomplished overnight, but by the power of the Spirit, we endeavor to preach the gospel where Christ is not known so that God can be worshiped by all people. That's the reality. You know, it's good to be with you this evening. I just can't believe that so many people turn out on a Friday night for a missions conference. That's pretty impressive, actually. And it tells me a little bit about your heart and that I also thank God for. I was listening to your singing, and I can tell you, I don't think in my time in the US, I've been here 15 years, I've ever heard a church that sings like you folks I, seriously, I'm not just saying that. I, I grew up in Northern Ireland, and that's, that was quite typical, where I looked around and I saw you all singing, I saw you smiling as you sang along. Now, of course, a banjo will make anybody smile. That's just the reality of a banjo. Uh, but, uh, wow, you guys just were uh, really 
ringing it out in those wonderful songs. If you have a Bible, please turn to Ephesians 1. You know, as, um, as I was hearing all the different folks share tonight, it's just wonderful to hear what God's doing all over the world, uh, and uh, we get to be a part of that. I just came back from South Africa. I spent 10 days there with some of our international leaders from around the world and getting to meet some of our, our workers and, uh, from all over, and many of our African leaders who are doing work among the least reached people there, and just my heart is full of uh, what God is doing and then getting it getting a little bit more tonight is just incredibly encouraging. But, you know, as I, as I have been journeying over these last few years as someone who's been a pastor in a church for a period of time, uh, you'll have to forgive me, I was a Baptist pastor, uh, but my three best friends in high school all became Presbyterian ministers, and they still are to this day. They're still my good friends. I was the black sheep, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and then as a mission leader, and... As I was journeying through my life and and being involved in mission, I was confronted by a couple of issues that I just couldn't get around and I couldn't justify. There was an incongruence uh, in in what I was seeing. Uh, One was what we saw in the video, that there are three billion in the world that will be born, live and die without ever hearing about Jesus. And that that number is growing every day by 57,000. Every day, 57,000 are added to that number. When we as OM started 60 years ago, the number was about 1.5 billion. So we're going backwards. How is it that in a day and age when the church has more resources than we've ever had before, resources as far as number of people in our churches globally, that the number is growing. God has done amazing things in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. If you go down far enough south, in places like India and China, the church is growing rapidly and, and, and to, to a large degree, but the reality is it's not keeping pace. But how is it when the church is so big and techno- with technology and finance that we have never had before, we're going backwards. What is wrong? And then I was uh, in my office just a few years ago. There was one of our leaders from the Muslim world sat there, and he said, Andrew, within 10 years, there'll be no traditional missionaries in the Muslim world. They'll, they'll just not get in. What did he mean? Well, people that will go in, leave their job, raise support, and go in in some covert manner into that part of the world. And he said, that's not going to work anymore. And it's probably a good thing, he said, because we need folks to go in with some sort of a value add so that there's more credibility in the community in which they exist. And so it caused me to go back to scripture, it caused me to look at church history, and it caused me to just to go back and say, God, what's missing? What's missing? Out of that came my book that uh, was mentioned earlier on, just this whole idea that maybe there's a bigger picture. Maybe, maybe there's something that involves all of us that God had in mind when he was creating the world. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. You see, what, what I find often when I come to a missions conference like this, and I get to speak in a few of these, and I, I sat in many of them growing up, I, I know that there's a few different categories of people. There's a, and probably this category is none of you folks, because you wouldn't be here on a Friday night if it was you, but there's the, there's the folks that's, that, that die for the off switch as quickly as possible. You know, that's the missions guy. I'm not called a missions, so I'll just flip it off and you know, play on my phone or, or do something else. But then there's other folks that, that have this burden for the nations. And yet over the years, that there, as, as they think of missions, the mission model didn't fit who they believed God had, had made them to be. They believed they were a doctor, they were an engineer, they were a business person, and, and that's how God shaped them. But, but the missions model often said, well, if you want to be with us, you must step out of that and come do this thing that we call ministry. And often I've met many people like this who come and tell me I felt like a second-class citizen all my life because I, I, I didn't step into that full-time ministry category. And somehow I felt like I, I, I really am not as spiritual as the others. And there's a whole gamut of people in between. You know, a lot of this thinking came from a guy called Eusebius of Caesarea. He lived many, many years ago, about 300 AD. He was very influenced by Greek thinking. 
He was the father of church history, so he's very renowned in the early church, and it was just at that period of the early church where things started to get a little bit more institutionalized, and Eusebius came along as a very key leader in the church in those days, and he introduced a Greek way of thinking into the the, the fledgling church of Jesus Christ, and it was this. He said there are two lives. There's the permitted life, and there's the perfect life. The perfect life is reserved for those who are missionaries, and pastors and preachers and and priests. And and they sort of live in some type of heavenly existence. And then there's the permitted life. And that's for the farmers, the businessmen, and all the rest of the people. And he said they live like, they have a second grade form of piety. And so he introduced to the church this idea that there's a sacred and secular divide in life that there's a dichotomized view of life. And that viewpoint has influenced, infiltrated, infected the church of Jesus Christ ever since, and we still live with it today. And to tonight I want to introduce through scripture an idea that as much is, is a biblical thought. It comes from, right from uh, creation, right through, in fact, from eternity past that debunks that idea that Eusebius brought into the church. And Paul introduces us to it in Ephesians 1. You see, we have to realize that as we, have, as we live our lives, and even in the church, as we've lived our lives as Christians in today's world, there has been many, many messages that have come into our minds. Everything from what the world wants us to think about how we should live our lives, how we should set goals for our lives, how should we should determine our purpose for our life, we have, we have systems in our theological thinking that have been infused over years by many different sources and, and people that somehow have maybe caused us to think about ourselves, about the purpose of God a little bit differently. And Eusebius is only one of them. And we have, we have gotten to a place where our thinking maybe is not as biblical as we might think it might be. It's a little bit like a parrot I used to have called Rudy. Rudy was a yellow-naped Amazon parrot. You know, I, you have no idea what that looks like, but he was about this size here, about the size of a crow. He was green with a little yellow patch in the back of his head. I, we were given Rudy. It's the only way we would ever have gotten him into our house. Uh, he, uh, he was hand-raised by a lady from North Carolina, and he talked like a lady from North Carolina. <laughs> it was hilarious. I think Rudy was male. We weren't really sure, but he spoke and shouted as a female uh, North Car- in a female North Carolina accent. Uh, he had a lot of other quirks, but one of the things about Rudy was this, that because he was hand-raised by this lady, Rudy never knew that he could fly. He had his full winged feathers, so there was nothing physically wrong with Rudy. It was in his thinking. He had been brought up to believe that he couldn't fly. And so Rudy lived his whole life. I I think he may still be alive in somebody's house causing terror wherever he's at. But Rudy would climb down off his perch and get onto the floor and then waddle around the floor to try and get around the house the way he wanted to get around the house. And if you've ever seen a parrot try to walk, it's not the prettiest sight because parrots were not really designed to be on the ground. They were designed to be in trees and they were designed to fly. But somehow he had been hardwired to think that he couldn't fly. And I believe as I I think of the church of Jesus Christ today and I look at the issues we have that that there's more unreached in the world today than there were yesterday and and we think of all of the things that are going wrong in in our world and, and I have to believe that some of the issue is because we as God's people have been hardwired by our environment, by many of, much of the teaching that we have gotten down through centuries to think a certain way and it is not as biblical as we might think it, it is. And therefore, we have withdrawn ourselves from the world. We have withdrawn ourselves out of society. We have somehow not seen what's going on out there as our issue. Or we've been made to believe that it's, it's the job of a few that are called to mission. But when we turn to Ephesians 1, I believe you're going to find something else. So if you turn to Ephesians 1 and and verse 4, Paul is saying this to this this church in Ephesus. It's an amazing passage of Scripture. And he's painting an amazing picture for them. He says this 
in verse 4 of chapter 1. And he chose us to be his very own, joining us to himself even before he laid the foundation of the universe. And so you get this picture that, that Paul's saying even before God did anything in regards to the creation of the universe, before he laid the foundations of the earth, another translation says, Paul said he loved us, he chose us to be his very own. Because of his great love, he ordained us so that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with an unstained innocence. For it was always his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children through our union with Jesus, the anointed one, so that his tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify his grace. For the same love he has, has for us, for his beloved one, Jesus, he has for us. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure. Paul says that before God did anything else, before he put an atom in place in this universe, he, as are they as the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, had this idea as they lived in community, perfect in every way, complete in every way, needing nothing, they had this idea. What if we had a people? What if there was a people that, that could experience our love, that would be known by us, that would be loved by us, that we would choose to bring into this community of the Godhead and they would become children of God, that they would become joint heirs with Jesus Christ, that they would know the Father and be loved by the Father and have this relationship with the Father through the Son. What, what if we did that? And Paul says over in Romans that, that because we are his children, we get to share in his glory. This whole idea that we, we as his creation were created to be in relationship with him so that we could share in who he is. See, God didn't need us to, to spend time singing and, and glorify him. He, had all, he was complete in glory. He had all, has all the glory he ever needed, but he desired to create a, a, a humanity so that we could experience his glory, that we could be in relationship with him. And so before he did anything else in creation, he came up with the idea or the purpose for which that creation would be created. You see, when we think of our purpose in this earth, we... We don't get, as creation, we don't get to, to determine our purpose, right? The, the, the created thing, after it's created, doesn't then set out to determine the purpose for its creation. You go back to the creator and, deter, and find out the purpose. And here Paul's saying, well, here's why God created you. He created you to be in relationship with him. What a wonderful picture that God created us to be in relationship with him. And you know, I love that when, when Paul goes on down in chapter one, he, he, verse 18, he says this, I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your heart or your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that he finds in us as holy ones. Paul's saying, I, I pray that you will know this. I pray that God will open your heart so that you will understand that he has created you for himself to be in relationship with him. I pray that your heart will be opened up to this idea that God, the creator God, created you for himself. And that's your reason for existence. But he doesn't leave it there. He goes on down in verse 12, right down to 14, and he says this, that it was God's purpose. He did all of this so that you would be for the praise of his glory. In other words, he, he says that he brought you into his family, he brought you into relationships so that your life would be lived out for his glory on the earth. And so then when we get down to the bottom of, of Ephesians again, he, he, he not only says, I, I pray that you will understand your relationship with God, the incredible love that he has for us, for you, then he goes on to say, I pray that you will understand the power that's available to you as you live out your life for the purpose of God, as you live out your life for his glory. But that will be real to you. And so this is what I, I, I want you to understand tonight. And, and some of this probably seems very familiar to you, but the pr I think so often is that we, we fail to grasp this. We fail to grasp who we are. And if you have an identity crisis, you will have a crisis of purpose. If you don't know who you are, it's very hard to be who you are. And so I want us to understand this before we go on, that, that, that God created us for himself, to be in relationship with him. And that relationship comes with a role 
to reflect his glory back to the earth. And so when I ask myself this question, are you called to that or are you made for that? The answer is you're not called to the purpose of God. You were made for the purpose of God. It's not delegated to a few. It's not a few who will go out into the world to reflect God's glory to the world. But every created human being was created for this purpose. And we know that Satan came in and tried to destroy it. But Christ redeemed it and restored us. Paul says we are a new creation. What's it, what does that mean? Well, we are, we are made, we, we, we've been put back into that place that God had for his, uh, the original tent that he had for creation, a creation that was made to be in relationship with God and reflect his back, glory back to the world. And so I want us to understand tonight that, that we're not called to the purpose of God, we were made for the purpose of God. And when you leave here tonight, the, pur the purpose, your purpose for life is not something that you have to still scratch your head over, but it's something that you must embrace, you must step into, you must obey. And what a wonderful purpose. You know, I'm 49 years old now. I've made some pretty dumb decisions in my life. I'm not that bright compared to many other people. How, how, how can it be that I would ever think that I could come up with a better purpose for my life than my Creator? How could it be that we as humanity could think that it's our job to, 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 to uh, dictate or, or come about, bring a, a purpose about for our life, rather than, than saying, God, I want to embrace the purpose you have for my life, and I want to step into it. You see, so often we live our life as if we are the picture, right? Like a, a, a puzzle picture, and, and we have lots of pieces to our puzzle. We have our work, we have our hobbies, we have our family, we have things that we do for recreation. We have lots of different pieces to the puzzle and then we say, God, will you come and be a piece of my picture? Will, will you come and, and, and come into my picture because I want you to bless my picture, I want you to be a part of my picture, God. And God's saying, no, 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 no. I'm the picture and I've made you to be a part of my picture. And it's our job to live in the fullness of his picture. And I don't know about you, but I would rather, I would rather be a piece of God's amazing picture than trying to paint my own picture for myself. So first of all, you were made for a purpose, God's purpose, clearly defined to be in relationship with him. That's your identity as a child of God. And the purpose that comes from that, to live out your life for the glory of God on this earth. That doesn't change. Nobody can knock you out of it. As a child of God, that is your purpose. But secondly, I want you to see that you've been uniquely shaped to live out that purpose. Shaped, S-H-A-P-E, in case you can't understand my Northern Irish accent, but in Ephesians 2.10, Paul says this. This is my favorite verse. Ephesians 1 is my favorite chapter. Ephesians 2.10 is my favorite verse in Scripture. Paul says this, we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. I love another uh, translation. It's the Passion Translation. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given to each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we are born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. What's Paul saying here? This is, this is really special, guys. Paul is saying this, that before God made you, in fact, in the context of Ephesians, this is not just before when you're in your mother's womb. This is before time. Paul's saying, just as in Ephesians 1, he said, before God laid the foundations of the earth, he, he, he desired a relationship with a people that would then live out their life for his glory on the earth. Ephesians 2, which of course there was no chapter verses in the original, Paul's saying, and in that period of time, he also worked out something else he w wanted us to do, and that was the good works that you would fulfill. And he said, Paul, Paul says, that God thought of what he wanted you to do, and then he made you accordingly to do those good things. God thought of what he wanted you to do, and then he made you accordingly. And so when you look at your life and you think, okay, I get the purpose, Andrew. Yes, I, I, I know that I'm here to reflect God's glory on the earth. 
How do I do that? Well then, if God thought of what he wanted us to do, the good works he wanted us to do, and then he made us accordingly, then the key to knowing what God wants you to do is look at how he made you. And Rick Warren, many, many years ago, came up with an acronym with his, one of his co-workers, Eric Rees. It's laid out in my book as well, called SHAPE. God give us all spiritual gifts. When we come into Jesus, spiritual gifts that he has given us for the, the building up of the body. Now, we've talked a lot about that typically in churches, so I'm not going to spend any time on that at all. But the problem is, is that often in the missions endeavor, we'd let, we've left the rest of SHAPE out. H, heart or passion. God has given each of us passions. We're passionate about certain things. Some of you are really passionate about art. Some of you are really passionate about sports. Some are really passionate about engineering, about medicine, about numbers and accounting. A one wonderful, special people you are, <laughs> the accountants in our midst. God has given us passions that are often linked to our A, our abilities. God has given us these unique abilities. And it, why would God have given us those abilities? So that we could live out his purpose on the earth. And so often in the mission world, and even in the church world, and I've been part of this, and I'm re constantly repenting for this message that I often give out, that, that those were the things that you had to lay aside if you wanted to come into the mission world and come with us to do this thing we called ministry. And one of the things that I've... I've come to believe is, no, if God created me for his purpose and uniquely put these things inside me, then he wants me to use them for his glory, for the purpose for which I was created. So if, I'm an, 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 if I am an artist, then I should be an artist for his glory. If I am an engineer, then I should embrace that identity as an engineer and be an engineer for his glory. Now, when I say if I am an artist, I mean if you are passionate about it and you're good at it. Okay? Because there's some things we're passionate about and we're not that good at. Marcus Buckingham, one of the English writers that speaks about this, he says, make those things your hobby and don't inflict the world, them on the world. <laughs> this is an example of passion and ability coming together right over here in the corner. But if God has given you a unique ability that's linked with a passion, he has given you that, not so that you can be a really good engineer, make lots of money, and, and you know, have three homes and a, and, and a boat and five or six cars or whatever the case may be. Not that any of those things are maybe wrong. It's a question whether you need all that. But his primary reason for giving those things to you was so that through you living that out in the world, you reflect his glory back to the world. Because that was the purpose for which he created you to be, to do. Spiritual gifts, heart, or passion, abilities, personality. We have all unique personalities. We must understand what that is and embrace it and make sure it fits with our abilities and our passion. You know, sometimes I, I often say, you know, if you're, if you're a, an introvert, then don't take a job where you're going to be selling things in front of people all the time. You'll, you'll, you'll wear yourself out, you'll kill yourself. Or if you're an extrovert, you get your energy from being around people and you take a job in a laboratory where you're working on your own all day, squeezing liquid into test tubes, you'll probably die inside. <laughs> but your personality is part of God's wiring and you have to pay attention to that. And then E is experience. Your vocational experience, your educational experience, your life experiences, the good things, the bad things that God is bringing about to shape who you are. And Paul tells us that even before you were born, even before the foundations of the earth, God was thinking this through and saying, these are the good works. Therefore, when Andrew comes into being, he's going to be shaped this way so that he can live this out for my glory on the earth. Paul, Jeremiah, Isaiah, the psalmist, all speak to this in different ways that before I was formed in my mother's womb, you set me apart for this purpose. This is a biblical truth. And so, yes, we're clear on our purpose. We're here to be in relationship with God and to reflect his glory back to the world. But secondly, that you're uniquely shaped to do that and pay attention to it. And I believe one of the greatest reasons for attrition in the mission effort around the world is this, that we have constantly taken people out of what they're shaped to do and put them into something else. And they burn out as a result. 
And secondly, I believe one of the great big reasons why we haven't seen a mass movement of people to the nations is because there's lots of people out there who say, I'm shaped to be an engineer, but, but your model doesn't fit. And it's one of the things I want to give my life to is make sure that we have models that fit every follower of Jesus so that they can go be who he has created them to be. And we'll talk about this in a minute. You see, here's, here's what I believe. That we, the people of God, created in his image, shaped to reflect his glory to the world, when we do that, when we live out our shape on the planet, that is, if when I'm a doctor and I'm in the ward, I'm in the hospital and I'm living out doing that for the glory of God, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing for the glory of God. When we do that, we are the most brilliant reflection of God's glory on the planet, in the universe. Do you believe that? When we live out the shape that God gave us, he gave it to us so that we would reflect his glory back to the world. We are the most brilliant reflection of God's glory on the planet. Why? We're made in his image. We have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. We've been uniquely shaped to reflect it back to the world. So the excellence through which we do it, the excellence of our attitude, the excellence of our actions, reflects his glory back to the world. You know, I've seen many amazing sights in my lifetime with traveling to some of the 85 countries now, the Great Barrier Reef, the Alps, the Grand Canyon, lots of things. And on and all of those occasions, I've stood back and said, wow, isn't God amazing? Isn't God amazing? And then I have to ask myself this question. When is the last time somebody has looked at my life and went, wow, isn't God amazing? because I'm a much more brilliant reflection of my creator than any of those things because I'm made in his image and I'm made to reflect his glory and he's uniquely shaped me to do it. But that's only possible when I step fully into it and embrace what he's called me to do, made me to do. You know, we have a worker in a very close part of the world and she went to be a nurse she said when I, I met her, she said, I went to be a nurse as unto the Lord. I, I, I knew that God had made me to be a nurse and I went there to be a nurse for his glory. And so she did. It was a government hospital in this very close country where very, very, very few Christians uh, are. And every day she would go onto the ward and, and live out her nursing uh, with excellence. And very quickly her boss saw her and said, you know, we'll call her Mary. She, he said, Mary, I watch you in the ward and, and what you're doing is excellent and, and I would love all of the rest of the nurses to learn this. Would you train all the rest of the nurses? And so Mary, who had an education background as well, said, sure, I'll put together a curriculum and she did train all the nurses. Very soon the CEO of the hospital took note and he said, there's something different with the nurses. What's happened? And, and her boss said, well, I've asked Mary to train all the nurses and he said, well, can can she train all the doctors as well, all the specialists, because everybody needs to learn this. And so Mary was asked to train every staff person in the hospital, and she did. And it wasn't too long after that 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 hospital in that region of the world was won the Magna Award for Excellence in Medical Care because of Mary. That CEO said, Mary, you're now reporting directly to me. He knew she was a Christian, a follower of Jesus. But she became almost untouchable. Why? because Mary was working for the good of the hospital. She was being the best nurse she could ever be. She was being the most brilliant reflection of God's glory. And you know, God's glory is incredibly attractive. People don't know what they're seeing, but they're attracted to it. And that's why Peter said, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within you. And, 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 and because when people see that difference, they go, there's something different about you. What is it? And every day, Mary was getting opportunities to give a reason for the hope that lies within in her. In fact, she would do Bible studies with a number of the Muslim ladies in that hospital. And she would take her material down to the, the photocopying room, which was under lock and key by the religious police. And she would hand over material to get photocopied. And even though they saw it was Christian material, they photocopied it because of Mary's position in the hospital. They knew Mary was on their side. What would it look like if all of God's people if everybody in this room realized that, you know what, I know my purpose now. I'm sure. That's what I've been, I'm, no more am I going to write my own purpose statement. I'm taking God's for me. 
and, and I'm, I'm going to just explore how he's made me, and I'm going to go into work on Monday morning, and I'm going to be the best at my job that I possibly be. I'm going to get more training. I'm going to try to excel in my work. My attitude's going to be different. I'm going to treat people the way Jesus told me to treat them. And we started to live out our faith in the workplace in that way. I believe we would start to see a different city. You see, this is not something you're called to do. This is something you were made to do. And every one of us was made to do it. And then finally, as my time is up, I, just, I want to leave you with this third thought to tie it into the missions week. Is this, that the, the whole world is on your job description as well. See, I believe this is another thing that we've gotten wrong by some of the teaching over the years, that somehow a move to a foreign field needs a calling, some sort of a special calling. And yes, that happens. I, I have experienced it myself. Yes, it happens. But when I went back and looked at Scripture, I, 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 I had to see it this way, folks. And you may or may not agree with me, but... but Everything I've just shared with you in Ephesians 1 and 2, Paul is saying that happened before time began, before the foundations of the earth were made. God decided to make us for a relationship and give us a role to reflect his glory in the world. He uniquely shaped us to do it. And then you step into time, Genesis 1, and there they are, humanity standing in front of God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, who have just said we've made them in our own image. And he turns to them and says, now would you go be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and govern it. The govern it is the work part that you're hearing a lot about over these, la these days, which is excellent. Work is part of what God created us to do. It's not part of the curse. I would love for it to be part of the curse. But no, work was what we created, uh, God created us to do. But he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. What, does God, what was God meaning then? Well, being brought up in Ireland, I was always taught to believe that was about having babies and lots of them, and we were good at it in Ireland, if you know anything about Irish families. But it's much deeper than that. I believe this is what God was saying. I have made you in my image to be in relationship with me with a, an incredible purpose to reflect my glory back to the world, and oh, I have uniquely shaped you to do that. You're gonna be farmers and, and, and engineers and doctors and nurses and plumbers and electricians, and, and you're gonna have lots of different ways to reflect that in the world. Now, would you go be fruitful? In fact, be so fruitful that you multiply, and multiply so much that all the earth is filled with people that are in relationship with me and are reflecting my glory back to the world. That was the mandate it gave to who? To all creation. Fill the world with people who are in relationship with me. And Jesus, over in Matthew 28, reframes it, the same mandate. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything I've taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'm with you always. Jesus was saying, would you go and make more of who I've made you to be until every nation has people who are living in relationship with me and reflecting my glory back to the world. And so as the, as, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, as the followers of Jesus on this planet, as the children of God, created for his purpose, what is on his heart, what came out of his lips should be our, uh, our on our hearts and on our minds also. His mandate should be our mandate. It's not something we wait for him to tell us one more time, would you go? Because he's already told us to go. So this is not a voice that we wait for to, to, to tell us one more time. It's a command that's already been made that we obey. And so as we gather here in Augusta, Every person in this room that's a follower of Jesus has been created for his purpose, has been uniquely shaped for his purpose. And the mandate, the parish, if you like, is the whole world. Now, absolutely, we need to be living this out in the workplace right here locally where we are. But I believe what we see in this video should break our hearts. 
that there is three billion that will be born, live and die, that will never ever hear the name of Jesus or watch the life of another believer. The number one reason why a Muslim, Hindu or Buddhist comes to faith is by watching the life of another believer and then understanding the message which changed their life. But there's very few who are willing to go and do that. Yet that was the mandate given to us as the followers of Jesus. And so I want to challenge you. Don't wait for a call. The command has already come. Wrap your life around that and ask, where can I go? To be who God has made me to be. If you're a doctor, we just got a contract for a hospital in a very, very close part of the world where we need to place 60 to 70 medical professionals who can go there, get a salary, work for the good of that city, every day rub shoulders with Muslim doctors and nurses and live out their life for the glory of God. We need people who can be coaches to CEOs in companies that can go in there and do life for 30 young up and coming CEOs in one of the most closed country in the world. We can get those jobs for people. What would it look like if the people of God in places like the US where there's hundreds of thousands of Christians, millions of Christians, many of us could go, not just a few, but many of us could go to these parts of the world where Jesus is not worshiped. Not only is it a mission mandate to obey, but it actually is us stepping into the purpose for which we were created. And there's no greater purpose. I'm gonna finish with telling you about another bird that I had. It was a parakeet, not a parrot. So it's a tiny little bird called Peter. I was given Peter because Peter had a pigeon chest and the breeder had no use for Peter. He was yellow as well. And Peter followed me all around the house. I was only 15 years old. And uh, one day I came home from school and, and uh, Peter followed me upstairs. One of the things I need to tell you about Peter was that he would fly around the room maybe one or two times and then he would collapse on the floor panting. And I was convinced Peter couldn't fly very well. This day he followed me upstairs and we were talking back and forward as Peter and I would do. Uh, and my mother was downstairs and she called up the stairs for something and Peter heard her voice so decided to go down to be with my mother. Problem was, as he flew down the stairs, the living room was a, a left turn, the front door was straight on and my mother had left the front door open for some reason and Peter went straight out the front door and I heard the scream from my mother that Peter had gotten out and I was panicked because this was my pet. I like Peter. And I ran down the stairs in blind panic and I got halfway down the stairs and then it dawned on me. <laughs> Peter can't fly. <laughs> He's probably lying in the front garden, panting like crazy. And so I run out and I'm looking around for Peter, no sign of Peter. And I look up in the sky and it seemed like 50,000 feet, but it was probably maybe 200, 300 feet. Peter, but there he was, circling around like a hawk, like an eagle. I'm thinking, Seriously? <laughs> but Peter broke free from the confines of what other people had put on him. Confines that caused him to not be able to function the way he was created to function. And when he broke out from that, he found a freedom, he found a delight that he never thought he could ever see. And I believe for us as the people of God, when we step into this God ordained purpose for our life, to live it out for his glory. And when we embrace the shape that he has given us and don't try to change it or step out of it, but embrace it fully and say, this is how God made me. I'm going to live it out for his glory because I'm the most brilliant reflection of his glory on the planet. And when we step into that purpose, then I believe you will find a freedom, that you will find a joy, you will find the pleasure of God. As Eric Liddell said, when I run, I feel the ple pleasure of God because that's what he created you to do. And I want to challenge you is, would you consider going somewhere in the world where God is not worshiped to do that? I'm gonna finish with a quote from Louis Giglio uh, uh, when he endorsed my book. He said this, throughout history, one of the greatest hindrances to fulfilling the global mission of Jesus is the idea that people must leave what they are doing and begin doing something new for the kingdom. The radi radical idea on Pact and Scatter is that it's likely that what you're already doing just might be the best door opener for you to be able to join God in his global, global work. It's not about what you do, it's about doing whatever you do for the sake of reflecting the face 
of Jesus to the world. Father, would you open our hearts and our minds to your word? Lord, would you help the, maybe the dust or the, 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 the mud of teachings that we might have gotten over the years or that have, that have infiltrated into our thinking? Would you help them to be washed away and that the true truth of scripture to come in? Lord, I pray that you will, as, just as Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, would you open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, that we would understand who you've made us to be. Father, that we would understand the power that you've made available to us so that we can live it out in the world today. And that this city will be a different city because of First Presbyterian Church and that everybody that comes through these doors understands that they're on mission for you in their workplace, in their community, in their neighborhood, wherever you place them. And that this church will see not just a handful going out, but tens of people going to the nations to be who you've created them to be for your glory. Awaken us to the opportunity that you've, you've given to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Andrew. Here's how the rest of the evening is going to unfold. If you are a missionary with us, if you would exit now through the doors and you can begin to stand by your booths. Uh, just a little while, I think in, I guess, Andrew, you have about 10 minutes to catch your breath or maybe a little bit longer than that, but uh, the college students or any of those of you who are young at heart at 8.30 at the depot across the street, Andrew's going to be talking to you. So you could walk and get to know some of the missionaries, but in about 15 to 20 minutes or so at the depot is where that will be taking place. We have one last slide, Put, if you would, Brant, about tomorrow. Just a reminder, tomorrow, beginning at 9 a.m., Dr. Uh, David Kim, or Reverend David Kim, will be with us, flying in from the stormy, cold New York City. He's coming into town tonight, and he'll begin at 9 a.m. in St. Andrew's Hall. We'll have some coffee and bagels just a little bit before that, but we'd love to have you come. He'll be teaching until around 10.30 or so, and then we'll be breaking up into our different vocational groups, so we'd love for you to attend that as well. If you have children, please pick those up now at, at, with the uh, booths. And uh, finally, just a final reminder, tomorrow night we have the parish gatherings. We'll have missionaries throughout the city meeting in different homes. If you're curious which parish to go to, or you can go to our website and we explain uh, different addresses to where you can go. So it'll be tomorrow night. So hope to see you tomorrow, if not Sunday, where David Kim will be preaching then. Thank you.